Welcome back to Heroes of the Faith, a show where we are inspired by the lives of the saints so that we can become saints ourselves. I am your host, Isaac Longworth, and I am so excited to introduce today's saint to you because I can almost guarantee that you have never heard about her before. She's not a very popular saint. She's not well known in the church. But when I was learning about her life, I thought to myself, this is a saint that people deserve to know about. Someone who needs to be more popular in the church. She's an amazing saint. And her name is Saint Agnes Le Tin Tan. Saint Agnes Le Tin Tan. She was born in the country of Vietnam in the year 1781. And she was raised in a Christian family. But we don't actually know too much about what her early life was like. Agnes was raised a Christian, but Christianity was not the main religion of Vietnam when she was growing up. In fact, it still isn't. Today in Vietnam, only about 7% of the population is Catholic, and it was even less back in Agnes' time. Most of the Vietnamese people in her time were non-Christians, people who prayed using a rather confusing mixture of different religions, Buddhism, Confucianism, local paganism, all forged together into kind of a local folk religion that the Vietnamese people worshipped in. And so many of them would have believed in reincarnation, that when they died, they would come back as some other kind of animal or as a different kind of person, that they had to live a good life in order to live in harmony and oneness with the universe. Many of the Vietnamese worshipped their ancestors. They worshipped those who had died before them, their family members. They would offer them gifts and sacrifices, trying to speak to them and reverence them in the afterlife. And they also worshipped, on top of all of this, other local gods, local spirits, uh, who were in charge of various geographical locations. Maybe gods would be in charge of certain aspects of life, like the family or war or crops. And they would worship these gods at temples and shrines. They would burn incense to them, offer sacrifices to them, and generally would try to appease them and seek their protection and their blessing. So a very confusing religion mixed with all of these different Eastern religions from different parts of, of Asia. However, in the 1600s, French and Spanish missionary priests began to journey to Vietnam and they began to share Christianity with them. These priests knew that the people in Vietnam had never heard the name Jesus before, never heard about him, never heard about what he had done for them. And so it really pained these priests to think of all of these people who were unknowingly trapped in superstition, in false beliefs about uh, gods and philosophies. And so they came to share with them the truth of the gospel. And when they came and started to share Christianity with the people, many of the Vietnamese became Christians. They left behind their false gods, they stopped worshipping their ancestors, they stopped believing in reincarnation, and they turned to the Lord Jesus. They became Christian. And this phenomenon was noticed by the emperors of Vietnam. The emperors noticed that many of their subjects were becoming uh, members of what they viewed as a European religion, and they were a little bit skeptical of that. They knew that some of their power was being lost over the people because the people were turning to this European religion, but they also wanted to have good relations with these powerful European nations. And so many of the emperors grudgingly allowed Christianity to flourish in the country, even though they resented it. But on a local level, in villages and towns, other Vietnamese people looked with suspicion and sometimes anger towards their Christian neighbors. They resented Christians because to them, it looked like they valued their new religion more than they valued their national heritage, their culture, and, and their pride in being Vietnamese people. They thought that the fact that there was some Vietnamese who were Christians and some who belonged to other religions, that weakened their national strength because they were divided. And they also felt insulted because the Christians no longer worshipped the traditional gods and ancestors that they had done before. And so they felt like the Christians were uh, betraying them, that they were traitors somehow because they were dishonoring the memories of their ancestors by not worshipping them as gods and spirits. And so Agnes would have been raised in this culture that would have treated her with suspicion at the best and open hostility 
at the worst because they sometimes thought that she was someone who had betrayed her people, had brought shame and disgrace to her deceased family members because she had embraced a foreign religion. But Agnes was willing to put up with all of this misunderstanding, with all of this confusion, because she knew Jesus. She knew that coming to the Lord, receiving faith in Jesus, was worth anything that the culture could throw at her. It was worth it for following Jesus. And so Agnes lived her life as a Christian. Eventually she got married when she was only 17 years old. And together she and her husband had six beautiful children, a beautiful family, a very loving family. And uh, Agnes worked as a housekeeper to help support her family financially. Now they lived a very simple and wholesome life. Agnes wasn't someone who by nature wanted to cause offense to anyone. She liked peace and quiet. Uh, she loved her neighbors no matter what their religion was. If they were Buddhist, if they were Confucian, if they worshipped local gods, if they were Christians. She loved them all equally, which was a really good witness to the people who suspected her for being Christian. Because they realized that even though they thought she was a, a traitor to her people, that she had betrayed the old gods, somehow she was still living a good life, which impressed them. I think that Agnes lived out very well this scripture passage that talks about what Christians should look like in the middle of a culture that doesn't believe in Jesus. In scripture, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 12, it says, Live quietly, mind your own affairs, and work with your hands as we have charged you so that you may command the respect of outsiders. And I think St. Agnes really lived this out. She lived her life quietly. She minded her own business. She worked hard. And she commanded the respect of outsiders, even though they didn't understand why she believed the way she believed. Now, if it was up to Agnes, she would have been content, I'm sure, to live this simple family life in peace and quiet, for the rest of her life. That's all she wanted. But her peaceful life in her village was about to change because a new emperor had ascended to the Vietnamese throne. His name was Emperor Mun Mang. He was an emperor who wanted Vietnam to get back to its roots, back to his roots. And he saw Christianity as a threat to that. He saw Christianity as this foreign invention that had been brought to his country and he wanted to get rid of it. He looked out and he saw that his subjects who were Christian were more loyal to this foreign God, Jesus, than they were to him. And so Emperor Mun Mang ordered a sweeping persecution to be carried out across the country of Vietnam. He gave explicit orders to target missionaries, priests, and any Christians who refused to leave their religion behind. He ordered all Christians to return to the traditional Vietnamese religion of gods and Buddha and reincarnation and Confucianism, leaving Jesus behind. And if they refused to do so, they would be strictly punished. Now, we actually have the original edict that the emperor sent out. And I want to read some of the words that he proclaimed in order that you can understand just how serious this emperor was about obliterating Christianity from his country. He wrote, I, Mun Mang, the king, speak thus. For many years, men have been preaching the religion of Christianity and deceiving the public. This religion of Jesus deserves all our hatred. But our foolish and stupid people throughout the kingdom embrace it en masse and without examination. So here the emperor is showing just how much he detests Christianity, that he thinks it's stupid and that he is disturbed that so many Vietnamese people are accepting the Lord Jesus and becoming Christian. He goes on to say, we must not allow this abuse to spread. And he starts to list some of the reasons why he thinks Christianity is so horrible. He says they have no respect for the god Buddha, they have no reverence for ancestors, and this is a great blasphemy. And then he says what he's going to do about it. He says, thus we order all followers of this religion 
from the bureaucrats down to the least of the people, to abandon it if they acknowledge and fear our power. So he says it doesn't matter if you are a high-ranking official or if you're a poor farmer. If you are a Christian, you must fear the power of the emperor and leave your faith behind. And he gives orders to the people in the country. He says, check carefully to see if the Christians in your territory are prepared to obey our orders and force them to trample on crosses underfoot. And so he's saying a good way to test if Christians have actually left behind their faith is to make them step on crucifixes, make them step on images of Jesus to show that they really have left him behind. And you must force people to do that, anyone who is in your region, anyone who is in your territory. He also says, for the houses of worship and houses of their priests, they must see that these are completely destroyed. And if any of our subjects is known to be guilty of these abominable customs, he will be punished with the last degree of severity, so that this depraved religion may be rooted out. This is our will, so execute it. These are very harsh words, and the emperor meant every single one. Christians who refused to leave behind their religion would be punished to the last degree of severity. They could be tortured to death for refusing to deny Jesus, for refusing to step on a crucifix or an image of Jesus in order to signify their renunciation. And the emperor's orders were promptly carried out. He was the emperor. He had so much power in the country. And so all the European missionary priests were either exiled from the country or put to death if they refused to leave. Vietnamese Christians who couldn't escape were imprisoned, tortured, or even killed if they refused to abandon their faith in Jesus. They could be arrested if they were caught praying together in houses or even out in the forest. If they possessed items like crosses or rosaries or Bibles, any of those things would be confiscated and they would be punished for holding on to them. If they were betrayed by neighbors who knew that they were Christian and had reported them to the authorities, they would be forced to either step or spit on a cross or a picture of Jesus to symbolize their rejection of Christianity. If they did so, they would be given their freedom. If they refused to do so, their property would be confiscated and they would be tortured or put to death. And so in this whole time of persecution, between 130,000 and 300,000 Christians were killed in Vietnam. Between 130 and 300,000. That's about one third of the entire Christian population at the time. A huge number of people who died for the Lord Jesus, refusing to leave their religion behind. And so with this terrible command of the emperor, Agnes, who at this point is now in her 40s, was put into a position that Honestly, she never wanted to be in. She was forced to choose between keeping her faith in Jesus and the quiet, peaceful life that she always wanted for her and her family. She just wanted to be left alone, but that option was no longer available to her. Agnes loved the Lord so much that she knew she could never abandon him, and so she decided to risk everything that she loved most dearly in the world, her life, her family, in order to keep following Jesus. And so Agnes didn't reject her faith. She continued to pray. She continued to raise her children as Christians. She would sneak away to attend Mass whenever there was a priest who was secretly celebrating it nearby, either in a private home, in the jungle. She was in constant danger all the time of being caught by authorities or being reported by a suspicious non-Christian neighbor. But Agnes went even more intense. She went even so far as to help smuggle priests from village to village in secret. She led them through jungle paths late at night. She arranged hiding places for them. She gave them disguises to wear so that they could pass by the police unobserved. She fed them, she cared for them, and she kept a lookout for spies and authorities that were trying to arrest them. 
She would also act as a messenger. She would secretly visit Christians who were imprisoned and bring letters from them back to their families. All of this was illegal and very dangerous. Now, Agnes continued this undercover work for many years. Even after she became a grandmother, she didn't stop. In fact, maybe nobody expected an old grandma to be this daring, and so she went by without being caught for many years. But one day, there was a raid on a nearby village, and a Catholic priest was discovered and arrested. Now, investigators who had arrested this priest, they traced his presence back to Agnes. They were able to find out that Agnes, who was now in her 60s, had helped keep him hidden for some time. And so she was arrested, as well as another Christian from the village who had been a part of this priest smuggling network. Now, the authorities knew that Agnes was involved in bringing the priests in secret from village to village. They knew she was a part of a wider network of Christians who were smuggling these priests around. And so they were determined not only to get her to deny her own faith, but they wanted her to give them information on where they could find more priests. But when Agnes refused to betray her friends and obstinately refused to desecrate a cross like they wanted her to, they began to torture her. Now, they thought that it wouldn't take much to crack this elderly grandmother. They thought that she would break under pressure soon and they would get the information that they wanted and they could arrest more Christians and more priests. And so they beat her and interrogated her over and over again, day in and day out. Often they would use a huge wooden bar, which they would bash her legs with over and over again until her legs were a bloody and bruised mess. But during these vicious beatings, Agnes would not give in. She would just pray over and over again, especially to the Blessed Mother Mary, Jesus' mother. She would pray to her over and over again, asking her to give her the strength that she needed to endure. Agnes had a very strong devotion to Mary because Agnes was a mother herself. And so it was easy for her to imagine Mary coming to her in her cell as a mother to love her with that motherly care, to comfort her, to console her during that time when she lived in that terrible prison. One day, Agnes's daughter was able to visit her in prison. The guards allowed her to see her children because they hoped that if they showed her her children, she would abandon her faith in order to go back home. It was this kind of emotional and psychological pressure that they were applying to her. And when Agnes's daughter saw her mother covered in bloody wounds, lying on the floor, covered in wounds from beatings, she burst into hysterical sobbing, just, just completely and emotionally wrecked at seeing her mother in such a state. But Agnes comforted her daughter saying, do not cry. These are my red roses of courage. I am suffering in the name of Jesus. So why are you crying? This beautiful woman, this grandmother in prison, beaten up every single day, and she's comforting her own daughter, telling her that she is suffering for the name of Jesus. So there's nothing to be sad about. These are her red roses of courage. She offered up all of her suffering to Jesus who had come to earth and she knew that Jesus had been beaten for her. And so she was happy to be beaten for him and she refused to deny him no matter how much they pushed her. The guards eventually realized that beating Agnes would not work. She would not cave. And so they devised an even more cruel torture for her. They took poisonous snakes and put them inside of Agnes's pants and they bound her legs together so that there was no way for the snakes to escape. Now, I don't know if you're afraid of snakes, whether they're poisonous or not, but you can just imagine how terrifying this must have been for Agnes. And so initially, Agnes began to panic. She was terrified as the snakes crawled over her body. They could bite her at any minute. But she said a desperate prayer in the middle of her panic, in the middle of her terror. She cried out to God for strength to endure this torture, and he responded. And the torturers were amazed to see Agnes, who had been panicking, who had been terrified. She suddenly stopped 
and she rested in absolute peace after saying that prayer. She was not phased at all by the snakes. In fact, it seemed like they weren't even bothering her. She didn't even notice they were there. No matter how much the guards poked her and and tried to irritate the snakes to bite her, she showed no fear, and the snakes never bit her. It's amazing to see this miracle taking place. She lived out in her life what Jesus promised his disciples would do here on earth. In Mark chapter 16, Jesus promised that those who believe in him will pick up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. And Agnes was living this out with her life. Her guards were trying to get snakes, poisonous snakes, to bite and attack her. And they refused to do so. And so they were forced to take the snakes out and put her back in prison. Well, eventually she just continued over and over again to resist the interrogation of her captors, to pray without stopping to Jesus and his mother Mary, until eventually she caught the disease of dysentery. It was uh, an infection that came to her wounds from the filthy cell that they kept her in. And so she got weaker and weaker, wasting away from dysentery until she died from her illness and the mistreatment that she suffered. But finally, her pain was at an end and she went to go to be with Jesus, who she had loved her whole life. Now, Agnes shows in her life that Christianity is by nature a counter-cultural religion. It is not a religion that is easily accepted by any culture, including her own. They looked at her as someone who disrespected ancestors and was a traitor to her country. And yet at the same time, they couldn't help but realize that she was kind to them and live a virtuous life. They didn't know what to do with her. They saw that she wanted to live a life growing old with her husband, her children, her grandchildren. And yet this grandma went on dangerous adventures to smuggle priests. What were they to make of that? And then here's this woman who's brutally beaten and tortured And yet she's able to comfort others and thank God for her wounds. Her faith helped her live a counter-cultural life, a life that didn't make sense to her culture and yet at the same time was oddly attractive. And that's a good lesson for us. As Christians, we are meant to live in the world, but we're not meant to live according to its values. I don't know about you, but I so easily find myself influenced by my culture. I'm influenced by all the things around me rather than being led by the teachings of Jesus. It's kind of like a fish being in water. Does the fish even notice that he's surrounded by water, that he's breathing it in, that he's completely surrounded by it? We're the same in our culture. We soak up the values all around us, even without realizing it. We think we live in a Christian country sometimes, but in reality, it's getting farther and farther away from the teachings of Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong, sometimes our culture matches Christianity, but very often it's in opposition. Our culture often calls things that are evil good and calls things that are good evil. It has distorted views about sexuality, about the value of the human person, about what the purpose of life is. We're constantly fed the culture's values in our media, in our entertainment, in what we read, watch, and hear. We see it in the people that we look up to in politics and education. All of these shape how we think. And so if we want to become a saint, we need to learn how to imitate St. Agnes, to become aware of the fact that we live in the middle of an anti-Christian culture, and yet we can live our faith to the full and stand as a witness to the counter-cultural nature of Christianity. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to be contentious or looking for trouble all the time or trying to be an obstacle to people. That's not what Agnes was doing. Agnes was just living her life simply and quietly. But when push came to shove, she didn't let the culture dictate what she believed, how she behaved. And the same needs to be true of us. We cannot let the culture lead us to disobey the teachings of Jesus. Rather, we are supposed to be assigned to the culture 
of what is true, good, and beautiful. Christians should live in a way that makes other people notice that there's something different about Christians. There's something different about how they behave, what they believe. Show them by our lives that we have different values from everything else that's going around us. And yet we need to live in a way that is loving and attractive to others, like Agnes in her village. And we will have the same effect that she did, leaving people confused and curious, thinking, what is going on here with these Christians? They're maddening in one sense because they don't believe what I believe, and yet there's something compelling about this Jesus that they say they follow. So let's pray now to St. Agnes, Lei Tin Tan, that we would be able to become saints just like she was. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. St. Agnes, your very life was a witness to the countercultural reality of Christianity. You showed that Jesus calls us to live in the world, but not to live like the world. So help us to imitate you in showing others that Jesus really has made a difference in our lives, that because of him, we live differently, we act differently, we believe and think differently than we used to that we don't act according to the teachings and the values of the world, but we live according to what Jesus has said. And help us imitate you in showing our love and virtue to others in such a way that people are not turned off from Christianity, but that they are attracted to the Jesus who we claim to follow. St. Agnes Leitintan, pray for us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen.